Hello, I'm Adrian Gowdy and this talk is a collection of hints and tips that I have collected from tutor sonographers and others who help teach ultrasound to novices to try and help people who are beginning in ultrasound to get over that initial hump of difficulty to help you to move from struggling to get recognisable images to reliably and routinely achieving diagnostic quality images. Now many of these suggestions you would have heard before during the talks and during the course but I think it's worth reinforcing them and in addition you may find that it's useful to come back and listen once again to this talk after you've been practicing for a few weeks or a few months just to try and see if there's any other hints that you've forgotten that might help you move along. So the first thing that you need to do is decide what transducer you're going to use for the job at hand. And as we've mentioned repeatedly, often this is a balance when choosing the appropriate frequency because you've got this trade-off between depth and penetration and the resolution that you can achieve at a given frequency. In addition, you choose the shape of the transducer with the appropriate size footprint. If you're trying to examine between ribs, choose the probe with the small footprint. And also, don't be afraid to change. If you're using, say, a curvilinear abdominal low frequency probe, but you see something that's more superficial, or you want to look at a more superficial area, then change to the high frequency linear probe and use it for that section of the scan. Many of the transducers these days are multi-frequency transducers and on some machines you can select the frequency for a particular transducer at its lower or upper range. And again, don't be afraid to change this during the scan. Presets are very, very useful and the company and the sonographers will help you set these up so as to try and optimize the images that you get. This deals with a lot of the post-processing algorithms that the machines all incorporate and other things that once you get a bit of practice you can start playing with but for most people who are occasional users it's much easier to just select the appropriate preset. As you've noticed you need to have an acoustic coupling medium, an ultrasound gel, so that the sound waves will be transmitted from the probe into the patient. Don't forget, gel dries after a while, and so you need to reapply a small amount. In the end, you can really use as much as you like. It does get a bit messy, but it's harmless, and you just have to clean it up afterwards. Make sure that you keep adjusting the depth as you perform the scan so as to keep the area of interest at its maximum size. Don't waste the computing power and screen space on something that you're not looking at. If you're looking at something at a depth of 3 or 4 centimetres, don't have your depth adjustment down to 20 centimetres and spend your time staring at just the top part of the screen but do make sure that important landmarks are also within your picture so that you can be certain of what exactly you're looking at. Many of the machines will have a movable focus, not all of them. Some machines do this automatically, but if you do have a machine with an adjustable focus, spend time to move it so it's at your point of interest or just slightly below. And once again, because you're going to be looking at different things through the scan, or even looking at the same thing from a different angle, you'll need to keep adjusting this. It's a very dynamic process, scanning, and if you watch an experienced sonographer, they're continually adjusting the machine to try and optimise the image. If you're unsure of where your area of interest is, generally having your focus towards the back of the image is better than having it too superficial. Make sure that your image isn't either over or under gained. If you 
have too little gain, everything will appear black and you won't see anything. If you overgain the image, then everything will appear too white, you'll overwrite fluid, vessels will look thrombosed, and you won't be able to make out the distinct structures that you're looking for. With a bit of practice, hopefully you'll find that the ultrasound probe becomes an extension of your examining hand. And what I mean by this is that you need to get to a point where you can look at the screen and then move the probe so as to adjust the image without having to keep looking back at your hand and watching move, the, move your actual hand. So learn to think when you're looking at the image, do I want to tilt that image and rotate it a little bit? Well, to do that, I have to twist the probe. Do I want to slide the image across? Well, I need to slide the probe up. It certainly helps me if I rest my little finger on the skin, helps stabilize the probe and helps me with my proprioception to do this. You do need to keep a reasonably firm pressure to help move the bowel gas out the way and to maintain good contact with between the probe and the patient. In general, most novices tend not to press hard enough, although there is always the occasional exception with the novice who presses far too hard. But a firm, gentle pressure is generally what you're aiming for. The one exception to this is if you're actually looking for veins. You tend to have need a very light pressure because often any sort of pressure will actually collapse the veins and then you won't see them. Get used to making small movements generally with the probe. As a general rule, in particular if you're imaging something at depth, a small change at the skin, because of the angles involved, will create large movements of the image. And as you're moving your probe, watch the image, watch how it's moving and make sure it's moving in the way that you want it to, to get the image that you're hoping for. Don't forget that body organs move with respiration. So sometimes what you do rather than moving the probe is you keep the probe still and watch the image move as the patient breathes in and out. And sometimes from that you can determine what part of the respiratory cycle you want the, the patient to hold so that you'll get the best image. And sometimes that's getting them to breathe in and holding, sometimes getting them to breathe out and holding. And then when they're holding the breath, then you make the small probe movements to finally optimize your image. Don't be afraid to ask the patient to move as well. During a routine, normal ultrasound, we will often get the patient to roll onto their left side, roll onto their right side, take a deep breath in, fully expire, we ask them to push their belly up to the sky or the ceiling. That helps them depress their diaphragm, pushes the abdominal organs, particularly the spleen and the liver, down to give you better views. Sometimes we ask patients to sit up. Sometimes we ask them to lie prone. You've got to try all these things until you get the window that gives you the image that you need. As part of that, don't forget the body's a three-dimensional structure. So if you've got a particular area you're trying to look at but something's in the way then you move the probe up and angle back down or move it down and angle back up. To show you what I mean by this if here is our object of interest but here we've got either a rib or some gas or something that's stopping us from seeing our object move the probe up and then angle down and often in particular if you're trying to look at the heart you need to make very small movements in order to do this to get between the rib spaces. So as we've mentioned, you have to keep searching for that ultrasound window that will show you what you need to see. And that can mean different rib spaces, different breathing or different parts of the breathing cycle and different patient position. You know, it's quite common if we're looking at the liver, for example, we'll look subcostally, we'll look intercostally, 
we'll take oblique views, we'll take longitudinal and transverse, all these things, just to try and make sure that we've covered fully the area that we're looking at. Don't forget, of course, that anatomy can be variable. Things aren't always exactly where you think they will be. And therefore, if you're looking for something and you can't find it, then you've got to search around. Sometimes kidneys are found in the pelvis. Some people, the spleen sits right up under the ribs. Others, it sits quite low down. The liver is very variable in its shape and position, right up in the chest or quite low down in the abdomen. Some people have a Riedel's lobe and it's long, thin liver on the right-hand side. Other people, the liver comes all the way around and in fact can come around and abut to the spleen. So you have to bear in mind people are different and keep searching through until you find what you're looking for. In patients who are very large and have a large abdominal apron of adipose tissues, don't put the probe on top of that. Get somebody to lift it up, hold it up for you if you need to, if you're, for example, looking in the pelvis or the bladder. All of this means that you'll have a shortened distance to penetrate for your images and there'll be less fat attenuation. When you're looking at the kidneys, don't forget their retroperitoneal structures. We're all used to reaching around the back of a patient to palpate for the kidneys, but often when people are scanning, they have the probe very anterior. Now, usually on the right, that will work reasonably well because you're using the liver in its acoustic window, but particularly on the left, it usually won't because the spleen's not big enough. And so usually if somebody is having trouble finding the left kidney or the left splenorenal space, without even looking at what they're doing, I can say to them, push your hand further back, hand into the mattress, push the probe into the patient, and now angle it forward a little bit. And nine times out of ten, they'll then see what they've been looking for. Don't forget, if you're seeing gas, well then, that's too far anterior. You've got to go further posterior to get behind the gas into the retroperitoneum. Here's an image that shows where we would routinely see the left kidney. The probe is pressed right back, posterior auxiliary line, my hand is pressing into the mattress in order to get the image. Don't forget as well that things can move, in particular bowel gas can move. And so if you've had trouble finding or imaging the particular structure you're looking for because gas is in the way, you've then gone on, moved the patient, and look for other things, it's sometimes worth coming back. You might find that the gas has now moved out the way and now you get a clear image. People who are beginning their scanning often have difficulty imaging the spleen. Don't forget it sits up above the rib margin and therefore if you're trying to see it from below the ribs you'll need to angle your transducer beam up under the ribs. It often helps to get patients to take a deep inspiration in to depress the diaphragm, push the spleen down under the rib as much as possible. Or alternatively, we move the probe to, in a cranial direction up over the ribs. And in this case, it often helps to just tilt the probe maybe about 20, 30 degrees so it runs parallel with the ribs. And this is what I mean here. Here we have our probe. Here is the marker here. We've gone above the ribs. So instead of being in a completely longitudinal direction, we just tilt it, probably not quite as much as I'm showing here, to try and help reduce the rib shadowing. There's a standard convention as to how the images should be orientated. And this is the standard radiology convention. And so the left hand side of the screen should represent the patient's right in transverse imaging. Or in longitudinal imaging, it's the patient's head, so the cranial end of the image. It, in a vertical image, it's the upside. The marker on the probe should be on the same side as the image marker that you see on the screen. Now, unfortunately, that all sounds wonderful, but sometimes conventions can conflict. 
for example, here. The marker is here towards the patient's head. That's the standard convention, but it's also down, which is the, against the convention. If it's unclear, then just make sure that your image is well labelled so that anybody else can look at it and understand what the image represents. Now, unfortunately, the echo convention is different. Maybe this is because cardiologists like to be different. But anyway, you'll notice on an echo machine or an echo setting that the screen marker is on the right hand side of the screen. Now the convention for transverse imaging is the same as with radiology. That is the left hand side of the screen represents the patient's right. However, for longitudinal imaging, instead of the head being on the left side of the screen, the head is to the right hand side of the screen. What this means in practice is that you have to turn the probe the other way when moving between longitudinal and transverse imaging compared to how you would normally do this. Now one of the most important skills that you can learn when performing ultrasound is learning to change the orientation of your probe whilst looking at a particular object. And the way to do this is you centre the object in the middle of the picture and slowly rotate the probe 90 degrees. You'll find when you're starting off that you'll tend to slip off the object, in which case turn it back to your starting position and try again. The full bladder is very important if you're trying to see things in the pelvis. Otherwise, bowel will tend to fall into the pelvis and gas will obscure your image. A full bladder pushes the bowel out and in, allows you to see both the pelvic organs and in particular, for our situations, small amounts of pelvic fluid. So if at all possible, perform your ultrasound before they empty the bladder, the patient, either depending on the circumstances, before they collect the urine specimen or before they put the catheter in. Some places, if, when they're performing fast scans, will actually infuse fluid into the bladder to ensure that the patient has a full bladder to allow good pelvic imaging. So finally, I'm sure you've realised by now that ultrasound is very user dependent. It does take an awful lot of blood, sweat, tears and time to become an expert. But fortunately for us, who are not full-time sonographers, it only takes relatively little practice to become good and competent at simple things. The more you do, the more you will see and the more information you'll get from every scan you perform. Thank you very much.